Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a very special guest, Megan Allman. She was on the Stand to Reason tour with me and her talk was on abortion. And Megan is a, an award-winning journalist. She's an, a Christian apologist and she specializes in bioethics. And I'm so happy to have her on today. And just as a reminder, we're on Patreon. And if you wanna help support the show, you can subscribe monthly as little as $5 a month, and that would help us out a lot. But let's get to this issue today. Obviously, it's this abortion issue and the Supreme Court leak is huge right now. So let's let's discuss all these things today. Welcome, Megan Allman. Oh, it's so good to see you, Beckett. Long time it, no see, right? I know. It's been like, what, a month since I saw you last? <laughs> Just a few weeks, yeah. In Augusta, mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the issue of abortion, I, I don't think we ever talked about this when we were doing the Stand to Reason tour, but what even drew you to this particular issue? Yeah, good question. Um, it, people, it was people. And, just, uh, and to explain that, when I was really little, anything I did dealt with people. I wanted to... Um, I wanted to draw people. I, I'm an artist, so I liked to draw. And, it, and that was always my subject. I didn't want to draw landscapes. I wanted to draw people. Um, when I read stories, it was always you know, a character that I connected with or a biography that I would get into. Um, and that just kind of stuck with me all the way through my school years. And um, so when I was working as a newspaper reporter, interviewing people, and uh, telling their stories. I wrote a lot of feature stories and profiles um, as, a, as a journalist. Um, I went to cover an event uh, where the man that I work for now was the speaker, and that was Scott Klusendorf, who is the president of Life Training Institute. So he was making a case for the pro-life view, and he was talking about things like what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. Why are human beings valuable at all? And these are kind of the, you know, the heartbeat of, of the things we think about all the time. We all want to know, like, what is our story and what are we about um, in our nation right now? Huge struggle over this question. What does it even mean to be human and valuable? Um, and so it was a little bit irresistible to be able to tell those kinds of stories. Uh, so that's, that's what I did. I went and um, pursued a master's degree in Christian apologetics. So I did the more general study but I came back to this because when we talk about pro-life apologetics, we get to talk about these questions. So, yeah, and so that's what it was. So obviously the world's gone crazy in the last week or so <laughs> because of this leaked Supreme Court uh, opinion or draft. And what, first of all, what is the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization? What is that? What is the leaked draft? Okay, well, basically what, what this is, the Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health is a case out of Mississippi that is seeking to limit or actually abolish abortion um, after 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. So the reason this is such a big deal, because there've been lots of little like state legislations in the last few years that have looked to um, at least limit abortion in drastic ways, right? The heartbeat bills that we've seen, and of course the Texas law that um, is still going strong right now. There's, there's yeah. not abortion really happening in Texas, um, at least not legally um, it, because of the way the law is. But these laws are looking within the framework of Roe versus Wade, that 1973 case that legalized abortion at a federal level um, mm -hmm. to, to try and overturn it. The Mississippi case is different because it's seeking to um, really prohibit abortions prior to viability. That's a big key word in all of this. Um, it's really a frontal assault on Roe versus Wade. It says, uh, no, we just reject what Roe says. We want to limit abortions before viability. And so what's this forcing, what this is forcing the court to do is to, re, to look at Roe versus Wade and the other case that's kind of established abortion precedent. It's lesser known, but it's Planned Parenthood versus Casey from 1992. Um, and this case is kind of putting them in a position where they're either going to have to overturn those cases and return the decision-making power back to the states, or they're going to have to keep them the way they are, which will strengthen um, the ability to, to seek abortion on demand in our country, which that's, I mean, it's very radical already. And so what, before I get to what viability is, what was the Planned Parenthood 1992 Planned Parenthood yeah. versus uh, Casey, what was that about? 
Yeah, well, um, we'd have to look back at Roe versus Wade for just a second. Um, yeah. You know, Roe versus Wade all by itself does not does not result in abortion on demand if you just all by itself. It breaks pregnancy down into three trimesters. Right. And it says that in the first trimester, a woman can have an abortion for whatever reason. So abortion on demand. The second trimester, states can limit abortions um, if in some way it's going to be a threat to the mother's well-being, a threat to her health. And then in the third trimester, they said, there's probably some interest that we have in these um, unborn children because we've, again, viability, uh, mm -hmm. which is it, just, I'll define it because it's important. It's the ability of that child to survive outside of the womb right. with medical assistance. Um, so at that point in time, interestingly, viability was at 28 weeks. Now it's at 24 weeks solidly, and it's scooting more towards 22 weeks. Um, right. So it keeps moving backwards. It's directly related to our technology. Um, so Roe versus Wade all by itself doesn't uh, allow all abortions, but Roe was passed with a sister case, Doe versus Bolton. And that sister case defined women's health so broadly that mm -hmm. the two together result in abortion on demand. Abortion now, on demand for all nine months? Yes, because you can, you can define health pretty much any way. Right. Emotional health, you know, financial health. Um, right. I mean, all, all these different types of ways. So 1992 was a moment a little bit like this one, because for a minute, the pro-life community thought, oh my goodness, they're going to look at this, they're going to overturn it. That was a Pennsylvania case. And it dealt with um, really the man's ability to either give consent or not for the mm -hmm. woman seeking an abortion. Um, so what the Casey case did, instead of looking at Roe and saying, oh, this is problematic, they deepened the precedent. And um, it wasn't just viability with Planned Parenthood versus Casey, but now the state cannot place an undue burden on a woman's access to abortion. Right. Um, so it, 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 it again, deepened that precedent. And so we still have, gosh, one of the most radical abortion laws in the world. Um, and you mentioned men. So what, what about men? Do men have any legal say whatsoever in abortion on demand? No. Okay. And so, although I will say that um, the pregnancy centers that I work for, so even though there's no legal recourse they can take, um, the centers that I work for and with who are providing care for families who find themselves in crisis pregnancy situations do say that when the man is there and lends his support to the situation, that woman is far less likely to seek an abortion. Right. And so what do you, what do you make of this leaked draft opinion? What, what do you, I mean, what do you think is going to happen? And are you excited about this development? What do you, what do you think? Oh, man, I think a lot of things. Um, I think the first th thing I think being who I am and knowing what I know is I'm afraid to get too excited because it is just that it's a draft. Mm -hmm. um, this is not the final opinion. And there's been a lot of reactivity to it naturally. Uh, but again, there's some time to be had here. And so we don't know if this will be the final opinion. I am hopeful that it will hold. And um, given the way that the Mississippi law is, is challenging Roe v. Wade and given what we know about um, you know, some, some of the justices who are looking at the constitution, because that's really it. You know, what does the constitution have to say about any kind of right to abortion? And um, can a state limit abortion or, or prohibit abortion um, before viability? These are the big questions at hand. And what about like an equal protection under, under the law, right? That's another aspect yeah. of it. Well, yeah, when we, we're looking at the, is kind of the, what people are tossing back and forth is, is there really a constitutional right to abortion as right. any claim? Yeah. And um, there are scholars who are both, um, you know, I'd say pro-life and pro-choice who would say that Roe versus Wade is not solid legislation. Um, so I think that this doesn't change a whole lot. Um, what it does change, if the decision holds, if the final decision is that Roe and Casey go, um, that means that our job shifts only slightly. The arguments don't change, but what it does mean is that the decision-making power goes back to the states. In other words, if Roe goes contrary to what we're hearing in the media frenzy right now, it will not end abortion. Right. It won't. 
Um, in fact, what we're seeing right now is states um, kind of setting themselves up for Roe to be overturned. Um, so we're seeing more conservative states putting these restrictions in place to keep unborn children from being aborted. And we're mm -hmm. seeing more liberal states who are, um, the, the wording is they're codifying basically the core of Roe within their state borders. Um, Colorado, where I am right now, is one of those states we have probably the most radical abortion legislation in, in the nation. Um, yeah, and in the, apparently in the Senate right now, I think I just in the New York Times today, in the Senate, they're already trying to codify Roe Ro v. Wade. But in, in the article, I didn't read all of it, but basically it said that it's, it's very unlikely that the Senate will be able to pass this. Yeah, um, I, yeah. So I, I, we will see. Um, but again, that, that I, I think I'm hesitant to get too excited, but of course, if Roe is overturned, that will mean that um, because the law is a teacher, um, so it will mean that lives will be saved and that is a good thing. Yeah, and so what is this, what are the ramifications of, if it does get overturned, mm -hmm. what are the ramifications for the pro-life community? Well, the pro-life community at first, along with every other American of voting age, gets their voice back. Um, that was what happened in 1973, is the court took matters into their own hands and, and made it into federal law so that right. voters from state to state had no say. Um, so pro-lifers for the first time in a long time, not only are they trying to convince their friends and neighbors that this is wrong, um, but now they're going to have the ability to take that voice to the polls when they're voting at a more local level. And that's a powerful thing. But I think that what we also have to be aware of realistically is that this was always going to look messy. I mean, we've had half a century of abortion on demand. Um, we've had, you know, rhetoric surrounding this and, and to where we don't even hear the word abortion anymore. We hear things like women's rights, uh, women's reproductive freedom. Um, you know, the way that it is, the narrative is in our country is such that, gosh, if, if we don't allow access to abortion, then we're not loving women well. Um, and so as a pro-life community, I think we have to be ready to be gracious in our responses to be smart, to be aware that um, this isn't like an us versus them type of issue. Um, gosh, I was reminded the other day, the, for those who have seen the film Unplanned, mm -hmm. came out a handful of years ago, That's it was awesome. Abby, yeah, it's a powerful film. Very um, powerful. Abby Johnson's story, but one thing I really liked about the film was that when they presented Abby early in her career, when she was working for Planned Parenthood, she was doing that because it was her conviction that she was doing the right thing. Right. Um, she wasn't out to kill babies. Um, it wasn't, so, so when we mischaracterize the issue, um, we're not gonna get very far in our, in our conversations with people, unfortunately. And a lot of that is what's happening right now is we're missing um, each other, missing the main ideas. So I think the pro-life community is gonna have to be smart. We're all gonna have to be apologists now. Uh, mm -hmm. We're all gonna have to be the ones who are giving solid reasons for why abortion is wrong. Um, and we're going to have to be ready to be gracious because no matter what, we know that abortion causes a, a lot of pain, yeah. um, no matter where somebody stands on the spectrum from pro-choice to pro-life. Um, and so I think that we need to be ready to be the ones who are offering healing and not just more condemnation. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those things. What, how do we make a case that stands for, pro, for the, for the pro-life position in today's chaotic world? Like, how do we, how do we present that? Yeah. Um, I think that what we hear a lot of times is that the pro-life position is just a religious viewpoint. And so it's often dismissed because of that. Now, I do think that it is wrong to dismiss an argument on grounds of it being religious, right? Arguments either stand or fall based on their merit, um, not, not because of their category, so to speak. Right. Um, but that's actually not the case. There are pro-life people from every worldview, essentially. <laughs> um, you know, there, I've, I know pro-life atheists. I know pro-life feminists. Mm -hmm. um, so so th that's one thing to keep in mind. But in this marketplace of ideas, it is possible to make an argument for the pro-life view that is grounded in science and in philosophy. And if the conversation happens to go deeper than that to a worldview level, so be it, because 
those things are rational and can be discussed as well. Um, but we can start by the meeting of the minds in the things that people are, are talking about every day in a very secular culture. Okay. And so how, because, you know, Peter Singer is, as you know, the, the ethicist at Princeton, he, this is what Peter Singer would say. Uh, he says, uh, he, he's, he holds that the right to life position is essentially tied to, or the right to life is essentially tied to a being's capacity to hold preferences, which in turn is essentially tied to be a being's capacity to feel pain and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And he argues in favor of abortion rights on the grounds that fetuses are neither rational nor self-aware and can therefore hold no preferences. As a result, he argues that the preference of a mother to have an abortion automatically takes precedence over anything else. And some singer argues that a fetus lacks personhood. Yeah. And he even goes so far as to, to talk about the singer talks about newborns as well. He argues that newborns lack the essential characteristics of personhood, rationality, autonomy, self-consciousness, and therefore quote, killing a newborn baby is never equivalent to killing a person. That is a being who wants to go on living. So how do you respond to that? And how do you present the scientific case? Yeah, that's a great question. And the tricky thing about Peter Singer is that he would grant the scientific case. Yes. Um, he makes a different kind of distinction. So, but just to lay out the science, um, embryology, that branch of science that studies embryos will tell you without fail, no matter which textbook you open, that we are living distinct whole human beings from the moment that we come into existence at fertilization. Um, so that's the established science. Uh, and, and with, you know, we, with a full set of DNA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. A whole yeah. genetic code that's different yeah. from the mothers and the fathers. So when people say, oh, it's part of the woman's body, or we hear a lot of these lines still because the science is still something that people are uncertain about or debating over at the popular level. Um, and so we have to go there. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, absolutely. But Peter Singer is an interesting one in a couple of ways. He is one who would make a distinction between humans and persons, which is um, in a lot of ways where the argument has gone these days. But Singer is also consistent. Now, we don't share the same worldview at all. Um, I, I think Peter Singer is a brilliant guy, but I think that his ideas are very dangerous. Clearly, we disagree on this. Um, and the ways that he is defining personhood, he understands that it doesn't just disqualify the unborn from valuable humanity or from personhood, um, but it also disqualifies newborns, which is why he advocates, um, I believe it's in his book, Practical Ethics, mm -hmm. um, that parents who are, um, for lack of a better word, dissatisfied with their newborn ought to be able to consult with their doctor and end the life of their newborn um, because the newborn's not a person yet based on his way of defining valuable personhood. Right. Um, so, but let's, let's just roll that back for a second. So he's making a distinction between mere humans, right? Unborn human beings. He wouldn't deny the science and valuable persons who deserve rights. Um, when he does that, he's essentially just to break it way down. Cause this is how my brain works. Um, he's saying that there are some human beings who matter more than other human beings. So some human beings have reached this special status called personhood. Right. Now, and what, he, what age does that happen? Um, he would say around 28 days or a month after birth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the word he uses sentience. You described it all, um, right. what, what he means by sentience. Um, but that's, that's the word I think that he, he would use. So, um, yeah. So when he says that sentience is the thing that grants us value, um, he's, he's, He's borrowing of he's 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 grand, grounding our value on a functional trait, right? Sentience is something that comes to you and me in varying degrees. Sentience is something that fluctuates in myself throughout the day. Like I mean, some of it's directly related to coffee. Like <laughs> yeah, or when you're um, asleep, you're not very sentient, you know. No, I'm not. Um, though I mean, a disposition like is right there. I could be, but um, but I'm not. So, but you're on to the the, the point that I want to make. If sentience comes in varying degrees, first of all, we have to ask the question, Dr. Singer, why is sentience the value giving trait and not some other trait? Like mm -hmm. what's so important about sentience and who says, and then how much is enough? 
right? Now, now he says, well, 28 days, that's minimally sentient. But when he grounds value in sentience, he doesn't just disqualify unborn human beings and newborn human beings, but whole other classes of human beings as well, including the comatose, right. including, gosh, Alzheimer's patients in the yeah. late stages of the disease. They're not sentient in the way that he's describing. And that's what happens every time we try to ground value. Well, first of all, we try to separate humanity from valuable personhood and then try to ground that personhood in some kind of functional trait like sentience. Right. Um, in fact, Stephen Schwartz is the philosopher who, who gave us the tool SLED. And I know you're familiar with it because you heard it six times this yes. year. Different so explain SLED. What is SLED? <laughs> okay. So Stephen Schwartz said, that there is no essential difference between the embryos that you and I once were and the adults we are today that would have made it all right to have killed us back then, but not now. So he said the only areas of difference you can really point out between the unborn and us fall into these four categories, the SLED. S stands for size, L is level of development, mm -hmm. E, environment or where you're located, and then D is degree of dependency. These are all functional differences or instrumental differences, sometimes I call them. And they don't work to say that unborn human beings can be killed and have no right to life, but we, we do. So we could look at just, I mean, size is a simple one. Some people will say the embryo is tiny, therefore it is insignificant. Right. But since when does our size as a human being have any bearing on our value as a human being, right? You and I are different sizes. You're very tall and I am not, I was a gymnast. So I'm like barely making it like five foot three, right? Um, if size is the thing that grants us value, you have more of a right to life than me. You're more valuable than me. I'm more valuable than mm -hmm. children. Yeah. Um, and so we, it just runs into this weird value spectrum. And on that spectrum, you know, you have, some human beings who matter less than others because they're smaller. But that's the way traits go. Level of development is the same way. In fact, um, Dr. Singer's argument is a level of development argument. He's arguing on grounds of something that is comes by way of development, um, sentience. Right. So level of development, the unborn are less developed in some way than we are. That's true. But gosh, toddlers are less developed than 10 year olds and 10 year olds are less developed than 16 year olds and so on and so forth. Yeah. If that's the value giving thing, then we have a whole classes of humans who matter less than others. We've created a spectrum. And anytime we create these spectrums, we create a society that's unjust. And right. I mean, gosh, if we go back to that simple idea that I, that I brought up, some human beings matter more than others. Gosh, Beckett, that's, that's what's underneath every injustice that we see. Right. Is this wrong idea. That sounds straight out of uh, the Third Reich. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that sounds like a very very dangerous uh, way to to gauge the value of human beings. Yeah. And you mentioned the ph philosophical argument. What, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's it. So sled is a version okay. of that philosophical argument, um, but it can. I mean, basically. As soon as we separate human from person, we're not doing science anymore, we're doing philosophy. And it's important to remember that because a lot of people, they go back to the science again and again. And um, fact of the matter is these days, anyone who is really informed on the debate, they might grant the science, but they're going to do something like Dr. Singer does and they're going to push for personhood. And that's how we know we're doing the philosophical debate. So what I would do is I would ask, what's the difference between a human and a person? So what is the thing that would make a human into a person? And whatever they name at that point, I would ask the grounding question. Why is it that thing and not something else? Right? Right. So we have to give some evidence for that. Why is that the thing that gives us value and not something else? And then I'm going to go into my, like, I'm going to use that sled tool as a guide. And whatever they name, let's say they, they say dependency. You know, it's completely dependent on its mother for survival, which is straight out of the sled acronym. Right. Well, okay. but. What about other people who are dependent, right? Other, other human beings who are dependent. What about someone with an insulin pump or someone or who has- Or palsy or something like that, yeah. Yes, who depends on someone for their care. Are they less, uh, less of a person? Are they less valuable and therefore less deserving of a right to life? What do we do with that? 
Um, so that, that's the way I would think about any of these traits or functions that people are naming that in some way would diff, you know, make us different from other human beings. Yeah. And you, uh, when you present on this issue, when you talk about this issue, you talk about the, maybe we've covered this, I'm not sure, but you talk about the one question at the center of this whole debate. Yeah. What yeah. is that? That's such a good, uh, a good thing to come back to, Beckett, because we lose sight of the big idea. Um, I think there's a lot of talking going on about abortion right now, um, but that's not really talking about abortion. Like, if you notice that people start to talk about abortion, which, gosh, Christopher Kayser is the ethicist who defines it as the intentional killing of the human fetus. Mm -hmm. um, and then they change the subject. And suddenly we're going to be talking about economics or poverty or something that's maybe bumps into abortion, but right. not about the issue itself. So it is important to understand the central question because that frames our conversations. Um, basically what I would say is we're hearing a lot of reasons for why abortion is okay, uh, why it should be legal. And I named a couple just now. I said, you know, poverty is a big one, mm -hmm. um, an appeal to privacy, um, an appeal to women being able to pursue their careers or their dreams or even their educational goals uh, without an unplanned pregnancy. And bodily, bodily that. autonomy, that kind That's of- That's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. Okay. Um, and we can talk about that. Um, but so these, so I'm, I'm, let me, let, let's get to that one and put a star on it because that one okay. is a little different. That one grants the science and the philosophy. Okay. Um, but most of the time we're hearing these other ones. Uh, I, unwanted children, disabled children who may suffer. Abortion mm -hmm. needs to be able to, so that they won't be born and then suffer. Um, again, these are compassion driven things, but just I think wrong headed. Um, we're hearing a lot right now about the fact that if Roe goes, we're going to see women who are harmed in back alley abortions or these dangerous illegal abortions. And of course, everyone can agree that anyone who is harmed because of an abortion is not okay. It's a tragedy. Um, so the list can go on and on and on, but just keep all those in mind and then think of a three-year-old <laughs> because a three-year-old we know is human. Like we mm -hmm. all know three-year-olds, they're a little bit crazy, but they're definitely human. Um, what if we were talking about three-year-olds that these were justifications for why we ought to be able to kill toddlers? Like people would think we'd lost our minds. We haven't slipped that far um, right. in our, in our society at this point. And the reason is that we know three-year-olds are human. Our question is, the question at the center of the debate, what is the unborn? Is the unborn human like the three-year-old is human? If they are, then we cannot kill the unborn for these reasons either. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't kill human beings that we know are human beings based on privacy or when they get expensive or when they're unwanted or when they're disabled. Um, we have no problem with laws that make it harder to kill toddlers in case the person who's seeking to try and do that might be harmed, right? right? So when we come back to that question, what is the unborn? Is the unborn human like the rest of us or not? It, it at least brings us back to the main point of the debate and back to the clarity that we need in order to move forward. And then we've talked a little bit about already the science and the philosophy establishes that not only are the unborn human like us, but they're also valuable like us. Um, in fact, if we were to go back to that sled conversation, the philosophical argument, what we find is that any functional reason given for human value is going to create that kind of value spectrum, that unjust society or that lack of grounding for human equality. There's no human equality there because those things come to us in degrees. The only thing that doesn't come to us in degrees is humanity. That's right. something you either have or you don't. And so philosophically speaking, um, the only answer that makes sense to the question, why are we valuable is that we are intrinsically valuable. We matter because we're human. Right. And, and, and I mean, the, the, one of the issues is, you know, for the secular humanist Darwinianist, then you're, there is no intrinsic value in human and being a human. Uh, we're just time plus chance plus matter. For Peter Singer, it's, it's pretty, it's understandable that he would have that position because why wouldn't you, if there's no God and you're, you're just all, all we are is matter and we live in a material world then why not, 
you know, why is there is there is no um, mm -hmm. kind of justification for being quote unquote pro life, right? So, mm -hmm. how well, would you respond to that? I would because respond. We're living to that. in as like for uh, sorry to interrupt, but for uh, Carl Truman in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, he talks about mm -hmm. you know we're living in there's three worlds, like the first world, the second world, the third world. He, he doesn't mean developing worlds, but we're living in these three worlds. And um, when we, when the, the third world are, are people who, I think it was the, the third world, are people who believe in a transcendent being. And in the second world, it's basically secular humanists. So you're, so we're, so we're basically talking past each other because there's no, we're, we don't have common ground to stand on. Mm -hmm. So how do we navigate that, that uncommon ground? How do we, how do we get across that? Yeah. Um, well, to go back to Dr. Singer for a moment, he, he might argue that way. And, and of course he's, he has to appeal to function as the thing that would be, would make us worth something and very utilitarian in his thinking um, based on his worldview. Um, but he does advocate for animal rights. And so um, he would use the same reasoning that he that he uses to disqualify the unborn and newborns from valuable humanity to say that there are animals who qualify as valuable persons. So all the while he is making um, metaphysical claims, like he's making claims about well these ought to be valuable for this reason. Again, that grounding question. But and what's his reason he... for animals? What's his re what reason does he give? I I. Becca, I don't know enough to tell you that, but I, but he, yeah, I, I, yeah, but he does. And he's a huge animal rights advocate. Um, but what I'm getting at is the grounding question still has to be answered. And I don't know that he really answers it. And that's where we differ with the secular humanist. Now, I don't know as far as intrinsic human worth, where to go, except ultimately the Imago Dei. Right. Um, ultimately, the image of God. And I'm comfortable arguing down to that level <laughs> um, because I believe that it is objectively real and true. Right. Um, but I think that there is a difference between those who are arguing for something, advocating for something, even if it's functional value. And then where do they go with it? Where do they ground it ultimately if the answer is, um, like you said, time and chance? Um, yeah. so, and, and how can they advocate for social justice if they have that mm -hmm. other worldview that it doesn't make sense? Those worldviews don't line up. They, they clash, in fact. Yeah, there's a lot of oughts and duties. And um, I think the best place they could go is something like, well, it's better for society. But again, on that kind of a worldview, there's really no such thing as better, right? There's no standard that's transcendent to us by which we can judge what the good is. Um, right. So better would just be what the society decided for itself. And we touched on bodily autonomy a minute yeah. ago. So it's, let's talk about that because I mean, it, you know, obviously a woman, not a man, but a woman, when she does get pregnant, she does have to bear that responsibility and carry that child to term. And, and it can, you know, disrupt her life. It can interfere with her goals. So what about that, that, Talk about bodily autonomy and what does that mean? And um, what is kind of your argument mm -hmm. uh, kind of against that? Um, yeah, well, let me, let me go to probably the best version of that argument that I know of. And okay. um, it actually came from Judith Jarvis Thompson who wrote um, an article, I believe it was called, mm, 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 I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, anyway, in 1971. So Thompson was an MIT scholar, a philosopher, and she gave what's called the violinist analogy. Um, and so when it comes to bodily autonomy, that's the one that for people who are you know, thoughtful on the debate, they, they go there, but it goes something like this. It says that imagine that you wake up, you're not in your bed where you fell asleep, but rather you find yourself in a, in a hospital bed. And as you come to, you realize there are all these tubes connected to your body that are running across the room to a stranger in another bed. And the doctor comes in, they see that you're there, they see that you're awake and they say, thank goodness. Last night while you were sleeping, the Music Lovers Society of America searched every available public record and found that your blood type and yours alone is the only one that's a perfect match to this 
world famous violinist. He has mm -hmm. a kidney ailment um, and needs your blood in order to overcome it. But don't worry, after nine months, he'll be well and you will both be free to go your own way. Now, Thompson said, man, it would be great for you to lend your support, your bodily support to this other individual, but in no way are you duty bound to do so. Right. She compares that to an unwanted pregnancy. And so her framing of it is that just like this situation, when you are pregnant and it's an unwanted pregnancy, in no way do you have to lend your bodily support to this other individual. Um, so that, that's kind of her argument. And we have an argument like that uh, or the basic form, you know, my body, my rights, or, or however we My body, it. my choice, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, what we have to come back to is the assumptions that are taking place underneath it. I um, mean, there's a couple of weird ones here. One of the assumptions is that somehow um, pregnancy isn't a, a, a good thing, right? Which is not how, generally speaking, in our society, we would look at it. Like when my brother called me to tell me that he and his wife were expecting a child, I did not go, I am so sorry, mm -hmm. right? Um, but this, on the face of it, treats pregnancy more like a disease than it does a good thing. Right. Um, and in fact, you know, again, observation wise, uh, this is I'm borrowing from Francis Beckwith here, who in his book, Defending Life, it gives a brilliant refutation of this. Um, but he said, you know, when a woman is in a car accident, she's unconscious, she's taken to the hospital and being treated, they begin doing tests and they find that this woman is pregnant. They don't rid her of the problem. They switch gears and begin treating two patients right, right away. So on the face of it, pregnancy is a good thing in our society. It isn't something that we look at as a handicap or a disease. Um, the second weird assumption that is kind of undergirds autonomy arguments is that somehow consent to sex is not the same thing as consent to pregnancy. Right. As if there's, there's no connection between the two, which is intellectually weird, right? Like how else do babies get here? Um, yeah. Uh, Rob, by the way, um, I can't remember his name, but he wrote uh, uh, Robert. I think his name is Robert O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. He he says that, and I think this was the progenitor to Roe v. Wade. But in you know the pill when it was approved in 1960, uh, effectively cut the link between sex and diapers. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. That is where the reasoning comes from. It, it cut a whole lot of links, right? We have that whole yeah. sex, marriage, and babies triangle that was all just undone yeah. and here we are um but it's still it sex leads to pregnancy like that's still something that is a natural thing it would be like well i you know i went to mcdonald's and i ate there for two months straight but i took diet pills <laughs> and i didn't ask for these 15 pounds i did not consent right. to that right. um it's just a little bit unreasonable but those those underlying assumptions are weird but when we look at thompson's argument we have to look at the parallels that she's making and i'll just name a couple that are kind of just problematic because if you give a hypothetical like that, if the parallels work, the argument stands, but if they don't, then the argument falls. And what we see with Thompson is I mean, she's comparing pregnancy to a prison bed. Um, and having been pregnant twice, like it's, it can be tough at times, but in no way was it a prison bed. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know many women who would describe it that way. Um, not denying that there are difficult pregnancies, but um, generally speaking, not a prison bed. Secondly, uh, that this child is not in its natural environment, like it's not supposed to be there, but where else is it supposed to be? Um, <laughs> gosh, I mean, seriously. Yeah. Um, another that she talks about, these are probably the big two, so I'll just do these, but one is that one's duty to their own offspring is um, in no way different than maybe their duty to a perfect stranger, mm -hmm. which is blatantly false. Right. If you and I were in the, if, if we were back at the standard reason conference in the auditorium and the room burst into flames and I knew my kids were sitting in the back, I'm running past everybody to get to my kids first. I'll save whoever I can, but I'm getting my kids out. Yeah. They're my kids. Mm -hmm. um, so that's weird. And then finally, and this I'm borrowing straight from um, Dr. Beckwith here, but the, the idea that an abortion is just the withdrawal of my bodily support is just weird, right? Um, abortion is an active killing, an intentional killing, and it's done in a number of um, 
very ugly ways. Yeah. Um, so he would say to say that abortion is simply the withdrawal of support is like saying that smothering someone with a pillow is just the withdrawal of oxygen. Yeah. Um, so there's a difference. Yeah. There. Ultimately, these things these things fail. And other ways we could look at it, just just for those who are interested, um, you know, unborn girls, right, in the womb are busy making all of the eggs um, that they will they will use in the future that, that, that it will either shed or that will become a baby. Um, if we're going to argue that abortion is the kind of right that is fundamental to us as human beings, um, which is the way many are arguing in, in this debate, mm -hmm. a right like the right to life or you know uh, the Bill of Rights rights that are named like uh, life, um, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, um, right. If it's like that, then these unborn baby girls have at the same time, one, the right to abort every single future child that they are, they, those eggs are not children yet. I'm not saying that, but they have the right by virtue of their nature to abort every single one of their future children, but they themselves, because of their location, do not have the right to life, um, which is foundational to every other right. So right. we have these contradictory ideas. At the end of the day, autonomy doesn't do, I don't, I don't think it does all the work that it needs to. We need more. We need to talk about things like human dignity, contrary to think what you know um, Steven Pinker might write about um, when, he, when he talked about an article several years ago now called The Stupidity of Dignity. Um, no, no, autonomy right. and consent are not enough. If, if the Jews had consented to the things that were done to them, would that have made it okay? Yeah. Okay. No, no. Yeah. So I... And so, I mean, you, what, what, cause you know, you talk about this issue a lot and what is, cause, and I've seen, you know, I've seen you obviously talk about this at, at the stand to reason conferences. And I think for a lot of these young people, these high school kids, junior high school kids, yeah. like the light bulb goes off. So yeah. what, what is the general response uh, to, when you talk about this issue, what, what do you, what's the feedback you, you get? Yeah. Um, well, I think that with young people, we go to a lot of schools, um, and churches and talk to youth. Um, I think a lot of them have just never heard a well-reasoned case for the pro-life view. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're not coming in with these, you know, crazy emotional appeals or things like that. Not that the stories are wrong to tell, like we should be telling good pro-life stories, um, but I think they're usually kind of knocked off center because they don't expect it. And so that makes them very open to listen, uh, which is very gracious of them to hear me out, to listen to the reasons and to compare them to their own view. So anytime someone comes to me after a presentation and says, wow, you know what? I'd never thought about that way, that way before you changed my mind, which happened a number of times this year at these conferences. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a courageous thing to say. It takes courage to change your mind. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think it must confront people who haven't really thought it through. Um, you know, I learned from my mentor, Scott Klusendorf, who is just one of the best men I know, and probably the best translator of pro-life academic ideas um, to, to a general public that, that I've ever met. And so to be able to have the privilege to do that and then have people respond in such a way that they go, I've just never thought about it that way before um, is a wonderful thing. Of course, you get you know, um, pushback. We don't get a whole lot of hostility. I don't think we're, we're I don't think we're presenting in such a way that we're, you know, we'll stir up hostility. Um, certainly people are dissatisfied or, or even sometimes a little bit angry at what we have to say, but, um, yeah, in the most part the the reception is positive. Mm -hmm. And what is like, what is the kind of I mean, there's, there's, there may not be one, but what's kind of the, one of the most potent things that you do say that does flip that switch in a person's mind and changes that narrative. And they're like, Oh, wait a minute. I mean, I know that video you played was very powerful, but like, yeah. what, what is, what is like one of the most powerful things if you yeah. just had like two seconds with a person that you could say, Oof. Um, well, I will say the video is powerful and the images I think used graciously. And that is so important. Um, the I mean, images... tell, well, we have to talk about what is the video, but just, briefly. Oh, sorry. Right. We don't have to describe <laughs> it in, in, in gory um, detail, but just, just give us. Yeah. It is a video of victims of abortion. 
And so it shows imagery of aborted fetuses from mm -hmm. early in a pregnancy through later in the pregnancy because of the way the federal law stands right now, it does allow abortion um, through all nine months of pregnancy. You know, people will be hard pressed to find someone to perform a late term abortion, but here in Colorado, they, they can. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we use that. But we use the imagery because oftentimes those pictures will reach people in a way that our words never will. Um, once you see it, 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 it kind of protests itself. Um, but yeah. as far as talking to other people, um, gosh, two seconds is tough. I think the Not two, two seconds, seconds, let's say, right. you, know, <laughs> let's say you just have a, have a couple of minutes. minutes, right? Um, I think that if you can relate it to them, right? Um, so as far as the presentation goes, I think the most powerful part, sometimes it's the science for, you know, the, the young women in the audience who have been told that it's just a clump of cells or just a mass of tissue that doesn't feel anything. It's not a, it's not a human yet. And then they see and hear this science um, that is life altering to them. Um, sometimes in a, a, a way that is very difficult because I might be speaking to a 17 year old who had an abortion and did not know. Um, so that can be significant for that individual. But on the whole, I think it's the idea that um, when we talk about why we matter, everyone wants to know that they matter and they do. Um, the world is telling us that we matter because of things that we can do mm -hmm. um, or things that we look like or, or, or you know, functions that we have, all these different things. And it's really hard to keep up with that. In fact, it's impossible. And so we exhaust ourselves day after day. If we want to put it in gospel language, um, you know, we can talk about, you know, we put ourselves on trial all day long trying to measure up because we forget what the gospel tells us. Right. Um, but I think that when we can establish philosophically that intrinsic value is the answer that makes sense, that means that you, Beckett, you know, and, and anyone who's watching or listening, you matter just because you're human. That has already been established by the one who made you. Nobody can take it from you. And that, that, that life altering truth, the minute you begin to walk in that, you become the kind of person that the world can't put labels on, can't define into a box. Um, it's very freeing and um, it's just good news. And I think that yeah. when you can make that connection to say, this is true, not only of you, but of every other human being from the moment they come into existence, including our unborn neighbors who cannot speak for themselves. Right. It shines a light on the fact that the pro-life view that undergirds everything the pro-life movement is doing is ultimately, it's ultimately all inclusive. <laughs> it's a, it's a human rights uh, movement. It's, a, it's, yes. not, it's not, it's not just an unborn human. It's a human rights movement. That's, yes. That's what we don't kind of fully realize. Yes, the story it tells us about ourselves is a better. It's a story that says you matter because of who you are, what you are, not what you can do or can't do. Um, right. Those are and, just those are just icing. <laughs> and then um, we'll kind of finish on with the objections that you get, or okay. the most common objections, and you know, rape, incest, mm. um, the mother's life. What do you say? What do you say to? Because I, you know, I've I run into, and I'm in LA, obviously, and, and yeah. you know, I go, I run into Planned Parent people with clipboards, and they're with Planned Parenthood, and yeah. and we we get, you know, sometimes I I do, I actually not that often, but so I've I've engaged a couple of times with those people, and and they, you know, they always go to the most extreme question, like, what about a woman who's raped? And so, what do you yeah. say to that kind of question? What's your response? Yeah, um, I do have responses to that question. If it were someone um, just on the street like that, I might ask them is, is your view that abortion should be illegal except for these extreme cases? <laughs> because that will, that will allow for a more honest conversation, you know, and, and I'm going to answer their question, but I, I, I'd be curious to know that. Um, because if their view is abortion on demand, then I want to know why we're talking about extreme cases exactly. and not advocating for abortion on demand. Um, I'm not going to be mean about that, by the way. I, I always assume somebody who's asking an extreme question is asking honestly, and they're fair questions. Um, so just to answer the question, and I'm going to ask for a lot of grace because, gosh, even in this, people are watching who have had rushes with this issue, um, and I don't know all the stories. So um, let's go to, to the understanding here, and then maybe that will help us with the other part 
Um, Because if somebody asks me about rape, I'm going to start by meeting them on the grounds that that word by just that word twists something inside of my gut. Mm -hmm. And it should for all of us. So it's not a case of, you know, whatever happens as far as my answer goes, we probably feel very similarly about, about what rape is and does. Yeah. Um, now I've never been the victim of rape, so I'm not going to be, you know, pretend that I understand what that's like. Um, so, so I want to make that clear. I want to meet them on an emotional ground. Um, but I will say that if we bring our hearts and heads together, because that's what we are as human beings, we, we have minds, we have hearts, we have all, all of it, um, that, the rape objection is like the other ones we named earlier, clearly psychologically different, but it also assumes that the unborn is not human like the toddler. Mm-hmm. And the reason I know that is because if we had a three-year-old who was the victim or who was produced when his mom was raped, um, we wouldn't be talking about whether or not she needed to do away with him mm-hmm. um, to help her feel better or, or whatever it was. Like in a civil society, how do we treat other people who remind us of terrible things? Um, so that's a place to start is coming back to the question. What is the unborn? Not saying this is easy. There's nothing about this conversation that is easy, unfortunately. Um, but we have to start there because we have to make distinctions where they need to be made. Um, I don't, there, there's a lot of things I think about, about that one. I think that, um, I think that when a woman is assaulted in that way, um, clearly women are not the only ones who are raped, but they are the ones who are raped and who can become pregnant because of it. Right. Um, when that happens, because of the evil that is acted upon her, not only are certain things taken from her, perhaps her innocence and her, her, you know, all, all of that, she's yeah. been violated in an unspeakable way, but also a normal option. That's another thing that has been taken away. Because what this woman is left with, if she conceives because of that act, mm-hmm. is she either is going to have an abortion, which um, is morally impermissible. That would be intentionally taking the life of an innocent human being, or she's going to carry that child to term. So really this one being impermissible leaves her only with this option. Now I would say the only option that she has because of that, what's done to her is that she has to be a hero. There are others who would talk about it as duty um, or things like that. I understand why they make those mm-hmm. distinctions, but I think what she does is heroic. Yeah. And I think it flies in the face of what was done to her. Yeah, I like that answer. And with the mother's life at risk, I know Tim Tebow, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think um, his mother. He's a living testimony. Yeah, like when his mother was giving birth to him, the doctors literally told her, you are going to die. I'm I'm pretty sure that, I don't know how, I can't remember the exact phrasing of it, but her life was definitely on the line. And she chose, she said, no, I'm going to, give birth to this child yeah. who ended up being Tim Tebow. So yeah. <laughs> what do you, what in, in that situation, I mean, it does seem kind of like um, a gray area because it's like, yeah. it's two lives at stake basically. So which do you choose? Yeah. How do you answer that question? Okay. Again, asking for all the grace here. Um, this circumstance actually happened to my best friend. Mm -hmm. Um, so she had an ectopic pregnancy, which is an example, unlike, um, Tim Tebow's where, um, if something is not done, that mother could bleed out internally because what happens is the embryo implants where it's not supposed to most often in the fallopian tube where it will begin to grow and it doesn't have enough room. It won't survive the pregnancy. Um, but if allowed to continue growing, she will rupture internally, um, So something like that, for example, because the truth be told, Beckett, so much can be done now that what we are talking about here is almost unheard of. Um, And that's not popular narrative, um, but that is the truth. It still warrants an answer because it's important. In an ectopic pregnancy, um, many of them do end in miscarriage, which is unfortunate as well. If we're going to be consistent, then we have to talk about that. Um, And the mothers who understand mourn their miscarriages. Um, but when nothing is, is done, the baby, that, that baby is still growing there. The doctor will make a call. And typically the call is, I have two lives at risk. I cannot save them both. So ethically speaking, in a broken world, I will do the greater moral good 
and I will act to save one rather than lose two. Right. In this case, the doctor will perform a procedure most often where they'll remove the embryo. Um, they might remove the embryo itself or a portion of the tube, depending on that. Those are some theological differences there. But when the doctor does that, that doctor can foresee that the embryo will die as a result of being removed. But the death of the embryo is not the doctor's intent. Right. That's what's different. His intent is saving his or her intent is saving the life of another human being rather than losing two lives. Right. Um, so abortion, remember, is defined as the intentional killing of the human fetus to save a mother's life when her life is at risk and to lose the other does nothing to tear down the pro-life case. Here's why. Like, I, um, I can picture um, I have several friends here who are volunteer firefighters or EMTs. Um, emergency medical technicians. So let's say that they come upon the scene of a trauma. And in that scene, um, I don't know if you've, like, you've seen enough crime shows or whatever, but what they have to do is they have to start tagging victims and they tag them according to the severity of injuries. Red tag means like, this is really bad. And then so on and so forth. And they begin working on those victims as they can. So let's say one of my friends is working on a red tagged victim. They begin working on victim A. And while they are trying to save victim A, victim B passes away. Their choice of victim A does nothing to tear down the humanity or the value of victim B. Mm -hmm. Victim B's death is a tragedy right. and a result of living in a broken world. Um, so I think these circumstances are similar in that way. Um, I, I would not even categorize that as an abortion, though medically it, it might be listed as one or in the Catholic church, which is very strict about the terminology, it would be called an indirect abortion. So even there, it's different um, right. than the intentional killing of a human fetus. Right. So um, I think that's important to remember when these things happen uh, later in the pregnancy, if the doctor can't save both, if they don't, if, if they haven't been told, you know, I want you to save my child or whatever, typically the doctor will choose the mother. Um, and the reasons for that are circumstantial. They yeah. don't undo the humanity or value of the unborn life that is lost. Yeah. And then the second to the last question, what, what about, you know, the, the common um, narrative in the culture now is, you know, men can't talk about abortion. Men don't have a oh. uterus. So, so you have no right to even address this issue. You can't talk about it. What do you say to that? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I say sound effects. No. Um, <laughs> All right, let's be, let's reason with this. Um, I get that it's a, a, an issue about which people are very passionate, but what I have given today is an argument for the pro-life view. We talked about reasons from science. We talked about reasons from philosophy. If you were talking to Scott, my boss, instead of me, he would give you the same argument, right? The argument stands or falls based on its merit, not the person giving it. And so that, that's what has to be evaluated here. To say that men cannot speak on the issue of abortion or can't have an opinion is silly. It would be like saying, hey, Megan, you can't have an opinion on war because you've never served as a general. Right. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, furthermore, and here is kind of tip, hard to see sometimes, but when somebody attacks you in that way, Beckett, that, it's, a, it's an ad hominem attack. Um, it's one that is attacking you yeah. based on your gender. And in most circumstances, we would call that sexist. Yeah. This really isn't different in that way. Um, I mean, you can point out alternate examples, um, depending on the person you're talking to that might inflame the conversation and not be helpful. But, you know, I saw a meme yesterday that based you know, in response to all that's going on. And it was just over and over again, men shouldn't make decisions, that are, men shouldn't make laws about women's bodies. Men shouldn't make laws about, and it was just listed over and over again. And by the way, the men, all it was all men who decided who Roe v. Wade. Who decided Wade. Roe v. Wade. I know. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just it's crazy. So um, yeah, I think that in these circumstances, if you can gently point out, and I would use maybe Greg Kokel's tactics. I think Alan was on and talked about tactics yeah, recently. Yeah. Alan Schleeman from Stand a Reason. Um, and so if you can use maybe that third Columbo tactic, the one where you're offering an alternate view in the form of a question, you know, have you considered that you didn't really listen to my ideas, but you attacked me based on my gender? And if yeah. I did that to you, that would be terribly wrong. 
um, and see if that takes you somewhere in the conversation. But um, at the end of the day, I think that that is a ridiculous claim. Right. And the last question is, I mean, this, this is, you hear this often and uh, I don't really know what the, 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 the actual reality of this is, but um, that you, the, the pro-life movement is only concerned with the unborn. They're not, mm-hmm. con- as soon as that child is born, they're just like, I'm out of here. And I don't, I don't care about this, this child who's, who may be born to um, a mother in poverty or whatever. Like I'm, you know, I'm just, I just care about the unborn. Yeah. So what do you, what do you, what's, what's the reality and what do you, what's your response to that? Yeah. Um, well, strictly speaking, that's another character attack. Right, that's an right. attack on my character an assumption about me as a pro-lifer about the pro-life community in general, that in some way they are not, they don't care about other people. Um, gosh, if we're doing formal argumentation, we could just say, you know what, let's just say that's the case. I don't believe that it is. I think we're completely opposite of that. Um, but let's just see, say that that's the case. How does that then give permission to intentionally kill innocent human beings? So I'm going to bring it back to the argument. But what I think that is not being told, you know, in, in the, what, what's really being mischaracterized here is the assumption that because the pro-life community, um, and again, go back to what we said earlier, pro-life individuals are from all different persuasions and worldviews. Uh, there are pro-life Republicans and pro-life Democrats and pro-life, you know, across the board. So, so there's that. But generally speaking, pro-life, the pro-life view is lumped in with a more conservative outlook. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the assumption there is that if these individuals are not willing to be more left leaning on other policies, dealing with the poor, dealing with immigration, dealing with other things like that, that in some way they are hateful and do not care about these other people. Right. That's a weird thing to conflate. Um, Gosh, Thaddeus Williams wrote a great article in World Magazine just the other day, highly recommend it. Um, I think it's titled Pro-Life from Womb to Tomb. Okay. Um, which is the way this is characterized often. And the point that he made was basically, there's a difference between saying that they don't care and saying that maybe they don't support policies that they find unhelpful when the things that they are doing on the whole, and by the way, Christians outgive mm-hmm. any other people group, albeit often privately toward right. helping the poor in just about any way that you can imagine, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe they find the policies unhelpful. So they disagree with the policies as the way to love people. Well, therefore, maybe that's their way of caring is to say, we don't support these policies that we find unhelpful. So there, there's a lot that could be said on the abortion front. What's not being talked about is the fact that pregnancy centers, which are largely volunteer run and are resourced by the generous donations of people in their local communities who support their local pregnancy center outnumber abortion providers more than two to one. And that number is growing. There are at least 4,000 pregnancy centers in our nation right now doing incredible work, not only caring about mothers who are expecting and providing resources, counseling classes to them, but also walking with them in the early years of that child's life. Um, They're often connected with churches who go over and above in these ways as well. These are the stories that are not being told in the pro-life community. So I find those charges a little bit weird. I find them as a way to dodge the arguments, but I also find that they're unfounded. Yeah, I agree. And um, well, we're going to have to leave it there. This is very helpful. Um, How can people get in touch with you or follow you on? I mean, where is there, do you have a website? Mm -hmm. Yep. Life Training Institute is at prolifetraining.com. There's no hyphen. It's just all mushed together. Prolifetraining.com. And that's where you can get in touch with us. Um, We have an incredible three-person speaking team. um, And so we will be glad to come and offer trainings um, wherever you happen to be. But we're also, there's a number of resources on the website itself that you might find helpful. Um, And so we're here to serve. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Megan. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining. And we will see you next week on the Becca Cook Show. (laughs) 